think we got everybody in, so let's go ahead and get started. This is very exciting. Uh, I'm Josephine Jen Morgan. I coordinate the Free Health Professions Program here at the University of Arizona. This is our 10th annual expo, our third virtual. Typically, we have this program on campus in the Grand Ballroom. We have a browse session, a lot of people on campus, but with COVID, this will be our third um, online virtual uh, expo. So thank you everybody for coming in today. I wanna to introduce my staff. And so I have Nnedi Gupta, she'll wave there. And then also Ethan Bull. And so the three of us are in the pre-health professions program here at the uh, BAS, the Bartlett Academic Success Center on the fourth floor. So please come in and see us if you haven't. Um, but we are welcoming you today. So on behalf of the A Center, the Pre-Health Professions Advising Program, and the Pre-Health Ambassadors. This is also really supported by our Pre-Health Ambassadors to help us with the programming, the setup. They will be our facilitators today. So we're real excited about having them take charge of what's gonna happen in the different panels. And for this particular one this morning, we're gonna have a breakout and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but today is a day where it's going to be back to back panels with different, you know, panels that will be going on. And so you're more than welcome to attend one, attend all, attend as many as you'd like. And if you know anybody who was unable to attend, we are recording the session. So definitely you can check on our website uh, as far as looking for it, as far as it being recorded. So we have some dynamic panelists this morning. And this morning, we're going to have the Arizona Health Professions Panel. Although it says Arizona, we have a lot of folks here today that are going to re represent other uh, health profession programs that you might think might be out of state, but they're here in Arizona and they have campuses here in Arizona. And so we wanted to bring this together and have it you know, available to you to talk to our different panelists. The other thing that I want to note is that we are going to be doing a, uh, by attending one or any of these panels, for the students, we will put your name into a drawing and we're gonna be drawing for an MCAT prep book package. It's about valued about $500. So these books are wonderful. They'll help you with your studying for the MCAT. And also for those other students, we have other books. So if we draw your name and you need a GRE book or PCAT book or uh, OAT or DAT, we also have those. So when we do the drawing, if you're not needing of the MCAT, we also have other prep books. So we'll do that for our drawing. Um, it is really exciting about doing this Arizona Health Profession Panel, because not only do we have the U of A Health Profession Programs represented, but as I mentioned, we also have other programs. Um, so the way that the breakout is going to work is basically we're going to do a main room, and the main room will cover MD, DO, ND, DVM, and then also uh, PA, because we don't have a person for PA. All the other folks will go into a second breakout room. And this was really based upon responses from last year um, about having one room with so many panelists, even the medicine room is gonna be pretty filled, but we're gonna also make sure that our panelists that represent other programs have time to really share the information with you today. So we're really excited about that. So before we move on to other parts of the program today, I wanna introduce you to Yanelli. And Yanelli is going to read our land acknowledgement. So before we begin, we would like to recognize that we respectfully acknowledge the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the Odom and Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through education offerings, partnerships, and community service. Thank you, Yanelli. So at this point right now, what we're gonna do is break out into uh, the anybody interested in MD, DO, ND, DVM, and PA, stay here. All the other folks, and Ethan will name those folks um, that are gonna go into a breakout session. And then we'll have our panelists at that point introduce themselves, and then we'll go right into questions for the panel. Yeah, and so um, I'm gonna open the breakout room in just a minute. Um, it looks like we've got representatives from pharmacy uh, and from nursing um, here. And so um, 
we're also looking um, this room was intended to have a, someone from an MPH, from a public health program, um, and from an OT program. So if you're interested in pharmacy, nursing, MPH, or OT, come on over. Uh, we don't have our MPH and OT panel, or we may have them here, and I don't see them in the chat, um, but I'm going to open the rooms now, and if you're interested in those professions, please join the breakout room. Otherwise, just stay where you are. So we'll take a couple minutes if anybody's going into the breakout room. All right, so all you are here interested in the programs I just listed earlier for the main room. And so I'm gonna hand it off over to, um, to actually to Yanelli and she's gonna take it from here. Hi everyone, my name is Yanelli Bolanos. I am a junior at the university and I'm studying biochemistry and Spanish. And now Love will introduce herself. Good morning, my name is Love Foster Malave. Um, I'm a senior at the University of Arizona studying molecular and cellular biology. So we would now like to take the time to have our panelists introduce themselves. Um, whoever likes to go first, feel free to go first and unmute yourself. And let's do a popcorn style. So uh, let's see, actually we have a list. So let's go ahead and start with Mark on my list. Good morning, everybody. My name is Mark Priolo. I'm the Director of Admissions for the uh, College of Medicine Phoenix MD program. Nice to see you all. And let's go with Mark Romero. <laughs> the other Mark. Uh, hi everybody, uh, Mark Romero from the College of Medicine Tucson. I'm the lead admissions coordinator for the traditional MD program. And Mona. Mona, I see you, right? Oops, I think you're muted. <laughs> so that we don't have the echo, I have to turn my speaker down when Mark speaks. Oh, gotcha. Um, okay. Very nice to see everyone today. My name is Mona Lopez. I'm part of the COMT Tucson Admissions Office. I'm also the program coordinator for the Pre-Medical Admissions Pathway Program out of Tucson. And Katie? Hi everyone, my name is Katie Berenson. I'm the Director of Admissions and Student Affairs at the recently new College of Veterinary Medicine at the U of A for your DVM. And Deanna? Good morning, everyone. My name is Deanna Hughes. I'm the Director of Admissions for AT Still University in Mesa, Arizona. Um, I basically do all the programs, so I heard you say you didn't have a PA rep as well. I'm happy to answer any questions about PA, um, but today I am here um, on behalf of the DO program as well. Oh, I love it. Thank you so much, Deanna. And is, did Joni, Jody Durham join us? I don't see her. All right, I think she's not here yet. And Monica Sanchez from Creighton. Nope. All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started because we have a lot of panelists as we have right now. So Yanelli, or actually Love, go ahead and take it away. Good morning. It's nice to see all of you here today. So we do have um, one question that we'd like to start off with and that would be, what does the selection process look like at your institution? Maybe let's start off with Mark. Priyo. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so the selection process at the College of Medicine Phoenix, we do practice a holistic admission process. So we're looking at a number of different factors. And when we kind of break it down for students, we, we really say it breaks down into three distinct areas. We look at your academic background, we look at your professional background, and we look at your personal background. So uh, we do consider a student's GPA and MCAT scores in terms of the academic metrics. Uh, we do look at uh, professional activities. So for the College of Medicine specifically, we're looking for clinical activities and some uh, kind of experiences that show that you have a desire to work in the medical field and some knowledge of what it's like to work in that profession, uh, some sort of patient-centered activities. Um, and then personal background. We talk a lot about individuals that, that thrive as, as uh, medicine or future physicians um, and the qualities that represent those types of students. And so we've actually outlined 16 of those attributes that are um, all laid out, uh, listed out on our website. Uh, things like being a selfless giver and uh, being a servant leader, 
uh, somebody who's compassionate and uh, a lifelong learner. So you can go to our uh, admissions website and see the full list of 16 uh, qualities that we value uh, in our process. And that's a, a general overview of it. So I'll uh, pass it on to somebody else. Can we have uh, Mark or Mona talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, it'll be very much the same uh, what Mark was talking about. Um, we take a, a holistic pro uh, approach as well. Um, the uh, Any requirements that we have are just kind of a bar to, of entry to um, the application process, any um, requirements for MCAT or GPA or BCPM. That's just kind of your, your way to get into the door, right? That's your foot in the door. And then from there, we look at similar criteria to uh, College Medicine in Phoenix. We look at uh, specific areas, specific um, specific skill sets. Uh, we look specifically for clinical um, letters of recommendation, clinical experience, and, and such. So speaking about um, also different, you know, medicine-focused careers, Deanna, can you speak a little bit about the DO process? Yes, thank you. So in addition to being a holistic uh, review, we would also like to see that you have some osteopathic uh, exposure. So I always tell students, try to shadow both an MD and a DO. So perhaps you can see the difference and maybe see the practice and, uh, and perhaps get a letter of recommendation from both because realistically, you, you may be applying to both MD and DO schools. So it would be nice for you to have exposure to the osteopathic uh, physician as well. And in the, that exposure, you know, we like to see that you maybe um, view some OMM, osteopathic manipulative medicine, which is um, you know, the manipulation that they might do um, as, a as a practicing DO. Um, somebody put in the chat, how is virtual shadowing viewed? Unfortunately for our DO school, we're no longer accepting D, um, virtual shadowing this new cycle. We did last year, but they um, changed that for this upcoming cycle. They're, they would like you to only shadow in person. So with all of that exposure to a, a, an osteopathic physician, um, your academics are obviously important, but um, most of all, being a good mission match to AT Still University means you have the heart to serve the underserved. And that is our mission and what we're looking for. Perfect. Um, you know, Katie, look, we have a brand new school. Can you talk a little bit about the veterinarian uh, medical school? Yeah, definitely. So again, for our process, it's exactly kind of like College of Medicine for Phoenix and Tucson. Um, we do holistic admissions approach. So we're looking for students that meet our minimum GPA, but then also attach their values to their essay. Well, how are you going to relate to our school? What our mission is? Um, we do the supplemental application, the MMI process. Um, we're a three-year program, so it's a different than the traditional four years for medicine. Um, and then you can specialize if you want to go into more surgery or anything to that matter for veterinary medicine. Um, but you do get your doctoral degree, so it's not a lot of students will consider, oh, I got my major as a veterinarian. And no, you get your doctoral degree. So um, if you're looking at becoming a veterinarian, this is the path that you would need to go in order to practice in the community. Um, but like Josie said, we're brand new. We have two classes so far. Um, we're admitting our third class right now, and they will start in August. Perfect. You know, one question that we always get asked from our, a lot of our students, and, and basically with Expo, it's really students who are maybe actively ready to apply. And so they've gotten their GPA, they've done their high stake exam, whether it's MCAT, you know, DAD or OAD or, or whatever. What do you feel makes an applicant stand out? And, and I guess the follow up question would be, you know, when we talk about shadowing clinical, can you give kind of a roundabout idea about how much time students applicants put into this? Um, and we'll go ahead and, and uh, bounce it off. Uh, who wants to go first? I'll throw it up. Jump ball. I'm happy to go first, and I would love to speak on behalf of the PA program as well, because it is a little different. Our PA program does require a minimum of 1,000 patient care experience hours, whereas our DO program does not have a minimum. Um, so we just have like an average uh, for the DO program. We would say uh, 200 
to 300 hours of, sh of shadowing and patient care experience would be desirable. But for PA, it's very competitive, um, highly competitive. And so the thousand patient care hours do need to be completed by the time you apply for PA. And so that is something that we do have as a, um, a requirement in order to apply. Um, but for DO, we just wanna see that you have uh, you know, some experience with the healthcare experience and it does not need to be paid. It can be volunteer, um, but we like to count shadowing and patient care hours separately. And let's go to Mark. Can you answer that same question? Oh, which Mark? Mark Phoenix. <laughs> Sorry about that. I didn't want to jump the gun again. No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> uh, yeah, certainly. So uh, I'm sorry. Can you re remind me of the question again, Josie? Sure. The, the question is about, um, you know, they've done their MCAT, they've gotten their GPA, yeah. you know, within the ballpark. So now we're looking at, okay, clinical hours, shadowing hours, you know, things in that respect. What, what type of advice do you give to students? Oh, yeah. So uh, at College of Medicine Phoenix, we really don't put a, a minimum number of hours uh, for those types of experiences on our applicants. Um, and the reason for that is we know that students are coming from a variety of different uh, backgrounds and preparation levels and, and sort of their journey to medicine may be different. So, you know, there may be students that have, you know, a few shadowing hours and, and they really have shown that they, you know, know what it's like to work in the medical profession. Uh, but then, you know, maybe a lot of their time was spent in a research lab or um, was spent in a uh, volunteering in a clinical setting. There's, you know, a variety of different approaches that students take. So we try and tailor it to this specific student situation. Uh, but really what we're, what we're looking for again is just you to demonstrate the qualities that make for uh, that successful medical school candidate. So uh, really just, you know, if you find that one experience that's really helping you in your journey um, and that, you know, that you enjoy, uh, the more hours you show for us, the better. But we, do, we don't put a minimum on there. Perfect. Um, Katie, can you talk about, you know, the process for DVM when you're talking about shadowing, clinical experience, things like that? Yeah. So we, again, don't have any minimum hours that are needed to shatter a veterinarian. Um, we always suggest having that, obviously. Um, we, what we value, what we tell students when they're applying to the application and what's going to make them stand out is not the typical response when you're a kid where you're like, I always wanted to be a veterinarian. I love animals. We all love animals, right? Most of us do. Um, but really, why? What's your passion? What do you want to help in the community? How do you want to help animals um, is really what we're looking for and what's going to make your application stand out. Um, but again, it is really just the same process that College of Medicine, College of, um, of Phoenix and Tucson, the holistic approach, we don't have that minimum number, but we definitely um, would value clinical hours with a veterinarian. Perfect. Let's transition into interviewing, right? I always tell students, if you don't get an interview, you don't get in, right? You could be in the applicant pool, but if you don't get the interview, you know, and that's where they really get to know you. So let's throw this out to the Tucson campus, uh, U of A College of Medicine, Tucson. Can you talk a little bit about your interview process and then kind of get a take on what everybody's experience is? What things do you want to tell students before they come in for that interview? But let's start with Tucson. Uh, yeah, thanks for throwing it over. Uh, so we are we're participating in MMI, so uh, multiple mini interviews. So uh, right now we currently have two tracks, and on each track uh, there are six separate interviews. So um, the hour or the process itself takes an hour or so. Um, you're with uh, each evaluator about seven minutes total, uh, and then you do that um, six times, and then you get around two minutes to kind of review a prompt. So. In those small little snippets of an interview, what we're really looking for is um, how well you can kind of specifically answer specific questions and uh, how well you can showcase specific attributes that we're looking for here at CompT. Um, all of our interview process and everything we're talking about today is really just identifying if we can find the best candidate for our program and if our program is the best uh, option for you, right? We're just kind of trying to find the best fit possible. And all of the MMIs are designed specifically for kind of identifying these traits in individuals and how well you can exemplify those traits. Mark, oh, Mark Phoenix, can you talk a little bit about it? interviews? 
Yeah, very similar for Phoenix. We also practice the multiple mini interviews. So we do uh, invite students to campus to uh, rotate through 10 different stations where we're asking questions. Um, and really the way we set ours up, I talked a little bit earlier when I, I talked about our overall admission process about those 16 attributes that we value in our process. We actually try and attach those attributes to each of the stations that we ask in our multiple mini interview. So those are the specific qualities that we're looking for when we um, kind of did, when we uh, come up with those questions and when we're, our interviewers are sitting down with them during that multiple mini interview. So uh, what, that's always gonna be our best guide to you know, kind of look at those uh, specific attributes that we list. So students, applicants, you know, realize those core competencies, those pre-professional core competencies is not a secret. It's out there for every health profession. They're looking for certain traits. So definitely, you know, tie everything you're doing into those attributes and characteristics and skills that you'll be as a future professional. But let's go ahead and, and bounce it off of uh, Deanna. Let's talk about your interview process. Sure. Um, thank you, Mark and Mark. The description of the MMIs is exactly what I would say. We, uh, our PA program also does the MMIs. Uh, they do eight stations at seven minutes each. So it's exactly the same as you described. And um, they are on campus and they also have a virtual option and the virtual interviews are run exactly the same as on campus. So you would pop into a room every, uh, you have seven minutes with your interviewer and you would have an interaction time with student ambassadors. So um, on campus or virtual, we give that option. Now the DO school, SOMA, uh, School of Osteopathic Medicine in Arizona, has decided to continue with only virtual interviews again for next cycle. And this is a, a recent decision. And the reason is uh, we have probably over 90% of our applicants come from out of state. Um, they wanna make it more economical for them to not have to travel so much and um, really make it more accessible to students. So um, we're going to continue with the virtual interviews for SOMA and they are not MMIs, they are, one-on-one -on -one with faculty, with three different faculty um, stations. And then you get an interaction time with student ambassadors and you get a group activity called Match to SOMA where you hear all about our CHC clinical rotations. Um, so with that, two different options. I will say though, we are planning a big um, accepted student day on our campus where you can come and get tours. In fact, we still run tours every Friday at 12 noon and our big spring expo on March 26th will also include all of the accepts across the program so they can come to campus and get a good feel for what it's like to live in Mesa, Arizona since they interviewed virtually. Perfect, you know, there's a question in the chat and it says, what advice do you have for freshmen and sophomores looking to build their application. I love it when we get freshmen, sophomores attending an event like this because then they can look forward and prepare themselves. So this is this is wonderful. So let's, uh, anybody can answer this one. I'll throw it up there. Since I'm unmuted, <laughs> I'll go ahead. <laughs> um, I love that question too. Thank you for asking that. And, and I love that you're looking into getting, you know, early experiences um, start with volunteering, you know, it doesn't matter if it's paid or volunteer, just if you can find some volunteer um, experiences. Somebody asked earlier about what kind of volunteering is more important, hospice or translating. Those are all important. I wouldn't say that we would value any more over the other, um, but you know, getting any kind of volunteer experience, you can try to look for a free clinic. In addition to that, we look at the non-medical volunteering to be a good mission match. So we're looking at, did you volunteer with uh, you know, a, a tutoring or um, big, big sister, big brothers, big sisters type of thing. So we're looking for the non-medical volunteering, the broad-based community service as well. And that's a great time to start that in your early undergrad. Get involved in clubs, organizations, sororities, fraternities. They do a lot of, um, you know, community service work. So those are great opportunities to get involved in, uh, in your early undergrad. Take advantage of your advisors and your workshops. We offer workshops on um, interview etiquette and prep for MCAT. Take advantage of those workshops. These are all virtual uh, workshops that we offer uh, every semester. So the, these are things you can do in your early undergrad as well. Perfect, anybody else? Uh, this is Mona. Uh, Deanne's answer was excellent. What I would just add is um, there are so many things you can get involved in. So consider those things 
that you genuinely have a passion and interest to do. Um, if you have an interest and a passion, you tend to give more, you also tend to take away more. Um, it's almost better to go after those things that you have a passion for than to spread yourself so thin that nothing really sort of makes a lasting impact to you. Um, so, so sometimes less is more. Perfect. I want to Thank add you. one thing too is um, pathway programs. You know, a lot of our schools, I know College of Medicine Tucson and probably I think the Phoenix campus says too for medicine and correct me if I'm wrong, Mark and Mona, um, but the pathway programs, you know, you have to apply to those when you are a junior. So look into those, making sure you meet all those requirements. So if you are a freshman or sophomore and you're wanting to go into medicine, check out, um, you know, we have a pathway program with the Honors College for Veterinary Medicine. And I believe Mark and Mona do too for Tucson and maybe Phoenix and maybe the DO programs too. But that's always an option is looking into pathway programs. That's a nice segue because there are different pathways to go to medical school or different health professions. So Let's have our, our different campuses talk about maybe some of their special programs. I can go first. Um, I'm the program coordinator for the pre-medical admissions pathway program out of the College of Medicine Tucson. Um, and this program is really designed for students who've demonstrated intellect and aptitude for medicine, not just from the scientific side, but also from the humanistic side. Um, and they have a great passion for medicine. However, these applicants sometimes have had less opportunity to become competitive applicants because maybe they've had to work while they were a college student and have had less time to do um, volunteer, community service, shadowing. Um, and maybe they also come from a family where um, there's less funding, lower socioeconomic statuses, um, immigrant um, individuals, uh, students where maybe English isn't the first language, um, students who may have grown up in rural or border communities where opportunities aren't the same or maybe sometimes even inner cities. The PMAP program is really designed for that student um, who's had to have handle more things on their plate. And so an additional year of foundational knowledge and skills would just ensure their success the next four years. PMAP medical students um, applicants must meet the 3.0 GPA requirement, the prerequisites, the minimum MCAT score. This is just a path for students where a little foundation is just going to enhance those skills that they already bring with them because of their very lived experiences. Um, these are individuals where we anticipate them to be great physicians again because um, they're able to connect to the different populations that um, reside in Arizona. Uh, many of the PMAP applicants are um, from populations less represented within medicine itself. Um, I'll put my number and my, my email in the chat. And if you're interested in the PMAP program, I'm always happy to discuss uh, the program with you. Um, I'm also willing to do after hours and weekends for those of you that do work. Thanks, Mona. Anybody else on special programs? I'll just jump in real quick because um, it's very similar to what Mona has already shared. Uh, we do have a Pathway Scholars program that's very similar to PMAP down in Tucson for the Phoenix campus. Um, and it's for all the same reasons, students that you know have experienced uh, barriers to their medical school preparation that are looking for that additional year of preparation before going in. Uh, it is a direct entry upon completion, successful completion of the Pathway Scholars Program, um, and which uh, concludes in a, a Master of Medical Studies. So uh, students do get a master's degree at the end of that program before transitioning into the MD. Uh, they take some of the same classes along with our first year medical students um, and receive some additional advising and support through the first year of that master's program before uh, they do start that MD program. So that's, that's all I'll add there. Perfect. Anybody else with special programs? There's one question. It's like the elephant in the room that students always ask me as a pre-health advisor. What is the difference between Tucson and Phoenix? You guys probably get asked. So we may as well throw that out there, get it out of the room. Um, how do you answer that Tucson and Phoenix? I think both Marks are kind of letting each other go. <laughs> Mark, Mark, if you want to go, go ahead. 
<laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, it's always a tough one because we are very similar. Uh, I think the biggest difference is that we're separately accredited medical schools. So that's the first thing that comes up is that if you are interested in both campuses, you do have to submit a, an application separately to each institution. And so that, you know, even though we are part of the same larger institution, that sometimes uh, confuses students. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, I think our clinical education varies uh, a little bit. I know there are opportunities for Tucson students to experience different sites, but you do have the one teaching hospital right there on campus. Uh, whereas up in Phoenix, we have a distributed model of clinical education. So our students are going to uh, Banner University Medical Center in Phoenix is our primary uh, kind of partner, but we also have students going to Phoenix Children's, uh, to the County Hospital Valleywise. We have students going to uh, St. Joe's and Barrow, to the VA. Uh, so there's kind of a, a, a opportunity to, to explore a few different clinical sites uh, rather than having the, the teaching hospital right there on campus. So those, uh, for me, are the two main differences that I, I can see. Yeah, I definitely would agree with that. Uh, I know that we specifically have uh, a large focus on rural health. Uh, so if that's something you're, you're interested in, we have multiple distinction tracks that explore rural health uh, that will allow you to kind of remotely go to different sites uh, over the summer and actually experience um, what healthcare is like there and offer additional healthcare. Um, but yeah, like Mark was saying, it's um, they're pretty similar programs, but I would kind of dig deep into our, um, our actual um, clinical criteria and uh, the things that we're teaching and see which uh, which uh, is a better fit for you. Perfect. Thank you so much. You know, there's a question in the chat about letters of recommendation. Uh, you know, many times when we're advising students, we talk about you can't do this in isolation. You know, you also have other folks that really believe that you'll be a great health professional uh, professional going into their careers. Can you address maybe some of the letters of recommendation issues? Let's, I'll throw it out to Katie. Yeah, so I see the biggest issue with letters of recommendation is kind of, um, Freya, what you indicated is how long. Um, you know, you can get some great letters of recommendation for maybe a few months of working with a veterinarian, but do they really know you? Do they know you as a person? They might know you kind of quickly um, since you've only worked with them for two months. So. We really try to consider students like try to get a good letter of recommendation for someone that you have worked with for quite some time, six months, a year, even more. Um, a professor, a professor is always a great letter of recommendation, especially if you've taken classes recently. Um, we have a lot of older students, so our older students can't get one from a professor, and that's totally fine. Um, but if you're listing them as a clinical experience, um, I suggest having a letter of recommendation from them because um, our faculty, our committee is going to want to see that. Why did you work with this veterinarian for five years, but you don't have a letter of recommendation from them? Um, that's not a red flag, but it's kind of a flag of what's going on. Why couldn't they get one for you? So um, try to think of that too. So if you're putting down that clinical experience, try to get that letter to show how great you did. Um, even office managers, sometimes office managers are a great way to um, show kind of your work ethic with working as a team. So we like those as well. I mean, we definitely require one from a veterinarian, but if you can get an office manager or someone that can show that you are willing to step up and just go to all means to get that experience is what we're looking for. And Deanna, you wanna tackle that question? Sure, we have a minimum of two requirements. Uh, the physician letter, which is an MD or DO is acceptable. We do prefer DO, but MD is completely fine. And the other one is a science faculty professor, and they're really um, particular on that. They want to make sure that they can um, see your academic readiness for medical school. And so there are some issues, like Katie said, if you are an older student um, or have been out of school for too long, um, I want to say that the best uh, idea is to go back, post back, and get some additional science courses to it, it can only help you. It boosts your science GPA, it gets you back into the academic game, and it gets you connected with a science faculty professor because it's really hard to reach back a few years and ask a professor for a letter if you if they don't remember you. So um, I highly recommend to continue to do some post-bac sciences if you don't have a strong science letter of recommendation. Perfect. Anybody else want to answer that question? 
Um, I would want to add um, the College of Medicine Tucson requires a minimum of three letters. I believe you can submit up to 10. Um, the clinical letter. Um, the clinical letter can come from a physician, a DO, a nurse, um, a volunteer coordinator, the business manager. It doesn't have to come from a doctor, but it does need to speak about their observation and their interpretation of seeing you interact with patients or patient family members. Um, sometimes we get a letter from a physician who speaks how well you performed in the office and all the things that you did, but doesn't talk specifically about seeing you um, interact with patients and patient family members, and we have to ask for another letter. So on your clinical letter, um, please ensure that that is one of the components that they add to the letter. Um, as Deanne said, a clinical letter, um, perhaps a letter if you've been employed, perhaps a letter from an academic um, in, individual that you've interacted with, but you really want these people to know you, um, to not just know your interest and passion for medicine, but to maybe even know some of the things that you've um, struggled with, that you've had to overcome, or some of the great success stories that you, you might have shared with them or that they're aware of. Um, because what we're trying to see in the letters of recommendation is that you possess, again, those attributes or characteristics that Mark has spoken of that we also look for. Um, so, so that's the letter of the, the intent of the letter of recommendation, to have affirmation from someone who knows you that you possess these characteristics and attributes. Perfect. Um, I think we had some folks enter the room, and I'm not sure if they might be our missing speakers. Um, we we're looking for Jody Durham and then also uh, Monica Sanchez and Patricia Rodriguez. Did any of those folks enter the room? No? I, I think, did not see them on mine. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and really encourage the students who are in attendance today to ask questions. So feel free to unmute yourself. Or if you want to throw it in the chat, that's fine too. And I encourage our ambassadors also, if you would like to answer, uh, ask a question, feel free to do that. Let's open it up to the floor to the students. Okay, in the chat, it says, let me go ahead and pull this up. Uh, do, do, do. Regarding student research, I'm working on multiple projects in different disciplines. However, I recently told that it would be better for me to focus on producing abstracts and presenting for conferences for one of my projects uh, instead of multiple. I've been producing posters and presentations. Uh, Let's see, poster and presentations for all my work, but would admissions committee prefer abstracts? Whoever wants to answer. I'll jump in first here. Um, I, for College of Medicine Phoenix, I think that's getting a little bit more specific than maybe our admissions committee is looking for. Um, research, we really are just looking for students to build the skills that come along with research, so it doesn't even necessarily have to be science related. We're looking for the critical thinking skills, the ability to kind of develop a concept from the beginning and kind of work through it. Um, certainly, abstracts and papers or anything like that will uh, kind of bolster that research experience, but it's not something that they're going to see, you know, maybe missing from an application and go, oh, well, this student's not qualified. So, you know, again, nice to have, but not necessarily something that we're specifically looking for. Anybody else want to tackle that question? I would agree with Mark, uh, College of Medicine Tucson. Uh, many of our applicants do not have research experience at all. Um, so, so not having research experience doesn't bar you from getting an admission. Um, so if you do have research experience, that again adds positive weight to your application. Um, quite honestly, it's really those skills that you achieve or attain by doing the research work, by doing presentations, um, by creating posters or even abstracts. It's really those skills that you're taking away um, from that experience. Um, so I don't think we get down to the level of one is better than the other. There's another question in the chat do you consider shadowing abroad and eventually letters of recommendation from physicians abroad as a substitute for local shadowing or a supplement? 
Deanna, you want to tackle that one? Sure. We definitely consider shadowing abroad as valid shadowing and a letter of recommendation from a physician that you shadowed abroad. A lot of times um, people will even do a medical mission over, you know, overseas or something like that, and they'll get a letter from somebody who's observed them with patients interacting. So that is completely fine with AT still. Nice. Mark Tucson, you want to answer that one? Yeah, uh, we definitely accept uh, letters of recommendation from abroad. Um, uh, there's no requirement that it has to be local or specifically in the US. Um, sometimes if you can speak about your experience abroad as well, um, that can bolster a bit of your application too, as long as you can kind of speak to maybe how your experience abroad has um, opened your eyes culturally or um, anything like that. Uh, so yeah, definitely accepted. And I'll plug in a little bit here too, because I do a presentation on letters of recommendation for our students. You know, be sure it's on letterhead. Uh, if it's, you know, with an organization um, that does, you know, abroad experiences, um, that it is really on letterhead and signed, you know, if it can be. Um, but you want to make sure that uh, it's coming from a program that you know, can really speak about your skills and traits and that it's been an existing program would be very helpful. So many programs, you know, kind of branch out in many different global areas. Um, so definitely make sure that your letters of rec do speak about those core competencies and, and really encourage that it is on letterhead. Anything else students that you wanna throw out there? I would love to ask our panelists um, about transfer students from community colleges and how they're assessed in the admissions process, and as well as if there's any disadvantages to those students. I can go for the veterinary medicine program. So with us, we encourage um, community college students to apply. Um, we use your cumulative GPA and it's not negatively looked upon at all. So when we get your transcripts, we're not going to say, um, oh, they attended a community college. It's not going to take as much weight. As long as you do well in those classes, that's what we're looking for. So it will be combined into your cumulative GPA um, with our VEMCAS application. Yeah, great answer, Kitty. Uh, like I was saying before, kind of in the beginning of the presentation, uh, the minimum requirements, the GPA requirements, is really just a bar of entry, right? It's how to get your foot in the door. So yeah, we, we really don't care where those credits are coming from, whether it's FEMA or Harvard, right? As long as you make those minimum uh, requirements, then you can really showcase yourself as an applicant. Just jump in real quick and say same for Phoenix. Perfect. Um, so let's say with our audience here um, for our different panelists, uh, what bit of advice would you give to students attending this session? And we'll have all the panelists answer this one. Uh, one thing I will say, um, just kind of going through our current cycle, is uh, if you're interested in the medical school, uh, really get to know that school. Uh, really identify if it's a good fit for you and if you're a good fit for them. Um, that really showcases itself in all aspects of your application, whether it be your secondary application, your interviews, um, anything like that, your, even your letters of recommendation, right? Um, so when you're applying to a school, really get to know them and um, apply to it only if uh, you're really excited about it and if you can kind of really see yourself going to that school. And I will add, um, and also to answer Ryan, yes, gap years are, are a great idea. Um, I would say the majority of our students do have at least one or two gap, year, gap years. And to add to the question from Josie, um, don't get discouraged if you don't get in the first cycle. It's completely okay. Um, better yourself. Make sure to reach out to admissions. My staff, what we do is we give you feedback on how you can strengthen your application if you don't get in the first cycle. So make sure to reach out early enough when you do know you're not getting an interview. That way you have time to improve. If you reach out to us in April, there's not a lot of time to approve before the next cycle opens. So make sure you reach out to us, apply early in the cycle. That's your best chances because we are rolling. 
And if you don't get an interview, then you'll know right away, call us, we can give you some feedback. I'm gonna second what Deanna said about don't being discouraged. Um, there's only 38 veterinary schools in the United States. So there is not a lot. Um, so do not get discouraged if you do not get admitted your first time. We usually have applicants that apply three or four times before they get admitted. So it's not something to be um, upset about, but come to us, like Deanna said as well, and we give applicant feedback. We will let you know exactly what was wrong with your application and how you can improve it. Um, another thing is being yourself. When you do those interviews, don't try to answer the way that you think we want you to answer. Answer the way that you would answer to talking to a family member or a friend. Um, we don't want everyone with the same answers. That would be a very boring class. So try to really tell, show us who, who you are, what kind of person you are in those MMIs and even the supplemental um, assessments that we do as well. Perfect. Did we get everybody? I think we did. Um, uh, sorry, ahead. Josie. No, go um, ahead. The only, the only thing I was going to add is it's never too early to reach out. Um, utilize all the resources that you have available to you. Um, you know, take care, take advantage of your uh, pre-health advisors, reach out to those of us at your meeting today. Um, there are students who are either in PMAP or in the MD programs who are willing to also talk to students. There are um, clubs and associations that you can participate in. Um, and the other thing is, um, I would encourage you guys to keep a reflection journal something that you can, um, as you experience different things, um, be reflective on what are the, what's the coping skill and what's the positive lesson that you took away from this experience? What was the growth that you had? Um, you know, we can sometimes forget things as we start to write down our personal statement, our essay responses, um, but you really wanna be reflective on what, what coping skills your life experiences are going to give you and how these coping skills are going to be beneficial to you as a medical student and as a future physician. Nice. I think that also kind of a, a nice segue into one of the questions that was in the chat uh, about gap years. You know, I, I think we see a trend of applicants who don't apply immediately after or, or wanting to get into a health profession program right after they graduate, but take some time so how do you feel or what does your committees look at when we talk about gap years? I can start. Um, specifically for College of Medicine Phoenix, for gap years, we're really looking for students to, if there's if they're trying to identify a particular part of their application that needs improvement. So usually, you know, there are gonna be students that are successful right out of their undergraduate or graduate program. But if a student comes out of that and says, hey, you know, maybe my GPA is a bit lower than I wanted, or maybe I need to get additional shadowing experience or, or clinical experience, uh, really just having that self-reflection and being able to, you know, kind of see your progression as a, a future medical student and, and targeting some of those areas that you want to improve. That's what we're looking for in those gap years, um, as well as just to, you know, an additional level of maturity that comes from another year of uh, waiting to go into that application process. So uh, those are the two main things that we're looking at. And I would add that you are typically applying a year in advance for the cohort start date. So keeping that in mind, when you submit your application, either through ACOMAS or AMCAS, you have to be competitive when you submit. We're not going to look at uh, future hours, typically. Um, yes, we, we'd love to see that you're continuing with your work and your volunteering and your clinical and your shadowing, but when you submit, that's when you have to have those hours under your belt. So a lot of people are not ready to submit right when they graduate from their undergrad. They need that additional year to get those hours when they submit their application. Perfect. Any other questions from our students that are in attendance? I actually have one question. So it's been recommended that I, or not exactly recommended, but there's an option that I take physics at a community college over um, the actual university. Would that be looked at differently compared to taking it at the university for admissions? 
Um, we're not looking to see where you took um, the course. We're looking to, to see that you fulfilled the prereq that's required. Um, so we don't uh, differentiate from community colleges um, to universities, except for the fact when it's an upper division course, and of course you have to take that at a university. Um, even doing online courses, um, so long as it comes from an accredited institution is fine as well. Okay, perfect. Well, just wasn't sure if um, a prerequisite would change that. Thank you. I think a lot of times, at least in the pre-health office, we get asked that question all the time, but we always make sure that we communicate with our admissions folks across the country. And, and probably the first thing that they want to know is that you're not an academic risk. You know, can you handle the curriculum once you get into a health profession? And so basically, if you take any courses at a community college, ultimately, when you come to a university, you have to take three and 400 level courses. And so you've demonstrated, so if you, you know, and they do look at everything, they look at trends and patterns and, you know, and, and that sort of thing. A lot of folks have to go to a community college for many different reasons, financial, access, times classes are offered. But ultimately, when you get to university, by the time you're ready to apply, you'll have four or five, six upper division courses that maybe biology or chemistry was a prereq, and you pull an A in biochem, you know your stuff. And so at least that's the response that I hear from admissions committees is that, you know, the concern about community college credit is really not what I think that's one of the big myths that's out there that people think, oh my God, I can't take courses at a community college. And I haven't heard any, you know, admissions folks across the country that say, no, you shouldn't. I think that's kind of one of those myths is self-generating uh, among applicants and, and bad websites is that come talk to your pre-health advisor, talk to your admissions people, look on their websites. And, you know, this is a whole package of an application process. And as you heard today in the panel, there are many different pieces of this application process. So you need to surround yourself with people who have accurate information and also to get feedback. You heard, you know, Deanna talk about, hey, you know, if you don't get in, don't wait too late to come in and talk to us. Not every admissions committee or, or college will, uh, you know, invite people to come in. If they do, embrace it and take advantage of that because then you get an insight on your application. And so, you know, today has been wonderful. I really want to thank our panelists for coming today. You've, you know, really given insight to a lot of students, applicants that, that we have. And I'm going to go ahead and, and hand it off back over to our ambassadors to bring us to closure. I think it was love. Love, you're on. Sorry, I was having some Zoom trouble. Um, <laughs> thank you to all of our panelists for being here today and being part of our 2022 Virtual Health Professions Expo. There is a break after the session from 9 to 9.30, um, but please feel free to contact through the chat um, and exchange contact information. We do look forward to our keynote speaker starting at 9.30, Dr. Dirksen, but thank you all.